Welcome to Season 2, Episode 6 of The Mixtape with Scott. Today's guest is a little bit out of left field from many of the other people that I've interviewed, but I read a book by this person during the COVID lockdown and have been wanting to talk to him ever since. He, they're not, he's not an economist, but he is an author and he's a historian of medicine, and I'm very excited to, hear, to share with you today uh, our interview. Before we begin, though, we must stop and pause and listen to these beautiful words by Sue Johnson from the book, Hold Me Tight, Seven Conversations for a Lifetime of Love, about the role that stories have and can have and normatively oftentimes maybe even should have in our lives. We use stories to make sense of our lives. We use stories as models to guide us in the future. We shape stories. Stories shape us. Interesting in what she said, stories as models. All models are wrong, but some are useful, said George Box. And if stories are models, then all stories are wrong, but some are useful. So what makes a story useful? If it helps us navigate our own life, and if it helps us make sense of our own life. That is what this podcast is about. I tell guests for each interview, in fact, that Mixtape with Scott is different from other econ podcasts in the sense that we're not going to be two talking heads talking about monetary policy. Uh, rather, we're going to be one talking head um, about a guest's life from childhood to now and how they got from being little to being big. Um, I firmly believe what Dr. Johnson said. I believe that stories can help us understand our own life. Sometimes in listening to another person's story, you actually, weirdly enough, as, as the, the better that person is at telling their story, somehow, even if it's a historian of medicine and an author from Britain, you will hear your own story and you won't know why it is. That is what happens when you listen to people with compassion, curiosity, without judgment. You feel connected to them. And when it concludes, sometimes you've been shaped by their story and it becomes a model, hopefully a useful model for you to go forward. So that said, let me give a warm introduction to Mike J. Mike, as I said, is not an economist. He is rather an author of several books on the history of medicine. Um, and he is, like many authors, a person who didn't start out being an author, started out really in music, um, but sort of through life surprises. Uh, sorted himself into this career as a historian of medicine, including psychedelic medicine. So, which as you may have heard is rapidly being decriminalized across the country, 15 cities so far, two states and imminent medical reforms coming that will probably reschedule some of these uh, medicines in the next few years. Some of you want to become an author. You don't know how to do it. Maybe here Mike's own unique journey will be very eye-opening, but even if it isn't, maybe just listening to and learning about someone new, someone very interesting will be kind of cool. So thanks again for tuning in to the Mixtape with Scott, season two. I am your amazing host, Scott Cunningham. Well, it is my pleasure to have today uh, in the, 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 the podcast uh, with me, Mike J., uh, uh, author and historian. Mike, thank you so much for uh, being on the podcast. Oh, it's a great pleasure to be here, Scott. Mike, can you, for the audience, tell, tell us just briefly, uh, you know, how, how you would go about introducing yourself to someone at a party about what you do for a living? <laughs> okay, I guess it depends partly on the party. Um, my career has been entirely self-employed, so it's been kind of picaresque. It hasn't had uh, grand five-year plans going forward. I basically am, as I have been for... Um, over 20 years, an independent um, journalist, a freelance writer. A, um, I've written mostly books, but I've also done quite a lot of journalism. I've curated exhibitions. Uh, I've worked kind of in and out of academia a little bit. So at the moment, I'm a honorary research fellow at uh, University College London. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, cool. Well, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Uh, where are you right now? I, right now, I'm in Cornwall in the kind of far southwest of, uh, of, of Britain. Oh, okay. Okay. Is that sort of a countryside kind of area? It is. Uh, my base is in London. That's where I work out of. But um, I'm just uh, 
down here right now. Glad to be out of the city and it's uh, multiple heat waves. Oh, okay. Yeah. That sounds like uh, I'm in Texas and I can, right. I yeah, can sympathize. You can, you can relate. Yeah. I can relate. <laughs> well, so before we get into your career, can you tell me about uh, your childhood? If we were to go back to maybe when you were like 10 years old, can you tell me about some of the things that, you know, an observer would, would sort of say, you know, Mike is this kind of kid or does these kinds of things. And, and also what you would say about yourself, if it's different. Yeah, okay. I, well, I grew up in um, the western suburbs of London. If you ever fly into Heathrow Airport, you'll notice kind of as you go into your final descent, you're flying over rows and rows of kind of terraced houses that were built in the 1910s and the 1920s. So it's kind of uh, what was called Metro Land. It was built when the subway extension ran out there. So I guess that was my world for the first uh, 10 years of my life. And mm. um, I was, uh, I, don't know, I, I don't have a lot of deep reflections about myself as a kid. I mean, I guess I could say I read a lot of books, which I did, and uh, I was kind of not super great at school, but I was quite into my schoolwork. But mm. uh, I was also pretty deeply into nature. Our mm. uh, house backed on to uh, a little bit of wetlands around uh, the canal there, and uh, I used to do lots of kind of tramping around um, mm -hmm. looking for bugs and insects and collecting leeches out of the canal and that kind of thing. Oh, so wow. I, I felt like a very normal kid, but uh, maybe somebody who was looking at me from the outside would uh, find it all very strange. Yeah, yeah. So you were a big reader. What kind of books were you reading as a kid? Sort of like- I, I was mostly reading the books that I was given as a kid and uh -huh. not many of them do I have a lot of um, connection with. I guess the- Two writers who I probably started to read about the ages of 10 and 11 who had stayed with me were H.G. Wells and uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, okay. Yeah. What were you in? So what, what were your like intellectual interests as a little kid? Do you, if you had to guess, was it, was there something that, that you would, that, a per, that would be sort of like a natural thing you were drawn to if you weren't given the books? Uh, I guess I was interested in languages and other cultures. Mm. Uh, from quite early on. Uh, languages was kind of what I thought of as my good subjects at school. I found them easy. Uh, yeah. But of course, this is a time when I had uh, uh, barely at all traveled outside of Britain. I had very little idea what the rest of the world was like. So I guess I had a lot of curiosity about that. Yeah, yeah. Did you have any, uh, any siblings? Yeah, I did. I had uh, younger siblings, uh, two sisters and a brother. Okay. And in the way of being an oldest kid, I guess, um, you know, around right about that time, uh, home was becoming a little less interesting for me and uh, mm -hmm. my friends and the stuff that was going on outside yeah. was more interesting. So I right. guess, uh, I guess I kind of, I guess I was on a mission of escaping from the home and discovering the world. Yeah, yeah. So did, so, so when you were uh, kind of later adolescence, uh, did you end up going to college somewhere? Yeah, I did. I kind of, um, got funneled through the school system from being academic enough, you know, to, um, uh, you know, be told that if I, you know, pursued my work and got good grades, I could go to a good university. And that was very much what my teachers were fixated on. Mm -hmm. uh, so I applied to and got into Cambridge University. Okay. Um, at the age of 18. I was just having a little second thoughts at that point. I was not sure that I wanted to do more schooling or being, being taught. I figured I was more interested in the real world. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what I did, having, having, having got into Cambridge, I then got in touch with uh, a whole bunch of um, advertising agencies and market research companies. Advertising mm. kind of seemed to me to be interesting and creative, you know, as, uh, as work went. So I thought I'd see what that was like. And, you did that uh, instead of you, you did that instead of Cambridge. I did that in the gap beforehand. You oh, kind the of, gap year, right? The way that the way that Cambridge works, you kind of have to do a final term up until Christmas, and then you've got that kind of December till September period. I see. So so I started, um, yeah, and and kind of everybody I wrote to said yes, come along, give it a try. So I spent six months then 
working in advertising for a lot of you know big agencies kind of mm. Saatchi's McCann Ericsson and people like that yeah and the first six weeks of that were great it was super exciting everybody I met was uh, very intelligent and um, smart and uh, creative and uh, it was, seemed like a lot of fun and everybody kind of went down the wine bars or pubs afterwards you know yeah. so hanging out with I had, being an older kid, I hadn't really had older siblings. That was probably the first time I hung around with people who were older than me. That was yeah. kind of interesting. Right. Uh, but after six months, I was starting to feel the limitations of this. Uh, mm. You know, when I kind of the people I worked with who I was interested in and respected, usually after two or three glasses of wine in the evening, they'd go, oh, this job is really shitty. I always wanted to be a novelist. I'm writing my novel. And as soon as I go, kind of, as soon as I'm successful, I'll get out of here. And yeah, uh, that was kind of so after six months, I thought, yeah, I'm not actually ready to commit to launching into this for the rest of my working life. Right. And I didn't, didn't have much of a plan B apart from by that time, I had a Super 8 camera and I was very interested in movie making. Yeah. Uh, so I went up to Cambridge. I read philosophy, uh -huh. and, um, uh, which was nowhere near as much fun as I thought it was going to be. And that was that was <laughs> that was that was my fault. I'd kind of uh, blithely assumed that I'd be, you know, I, if I spent three years doing philosophy, I'd kind of uh, have deeper understanding of the meaning of life. But in right. fact, three years of studying Wittgenstein does, does not take you to that place. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, and, right. And, and during that time, I was also getting more and more into um, filmmaking and mm. uh, thinking that was what I wanted to do when I left um, university. Mm. Uh, so I had the sense that, um, you know, I was kind of tired of reading books. Um, the written word felt to me like something that was dying uh the language that everything seemed to be happening in you know cinema and uh, music and everything was the visual language yeah so i so, so i thought when i left cambridge i went okay i'm never going to read another book i'm done with that i've got my camera and i'm going to go and make movies right 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 oh so you went and made movies so wait did you graduate from cambridge or did you leave? I no i i graduated from cambridge what and, year was that uh, what year was that what year was that 1981 Okay. Okay. And um, that was a great period of time in Britain. Uh, music scene. Music scene was fantastic, incredibly absorbing and immersive and lively. It was kind of post-punk with, you know, the beginnings of what we'd now call kind of industrial music and electronic music coming yeah. out of, you know, this really intense social um movement it was yeah. also a great time for cinema you know just every week something like blade runner or mad max right. 2 would, would drop yeah uh, so that seemed to me much more appealing uh than, than the academy or the sort of mm. uh, you know the, the world of writing at that point mm. so you, so you're you're actually graduating with the um the ambition to be a a really a a, a professional creative person uh making yeah. making film yeah so what, what happens? How, how do you, how, what's your plan at that time? Uh, I was, I mean, very little in the way of a plan, but I had a couple of uh, friends who had been working that summer in uh, Berlin, working on the building, the, um, the U-Bahn, the subway out there. So I went to stay with them and crashed in their flat for a little bit and mm. then met a, uh, um, a music producer there who had a 24 track studio and had just acquired on the floor below in one of these endless kind of, uh, in, you know, incredibly cheap um, Berlin warehouses, uh, a video studio. And he was looking for uh, someone to make videos for the uh, records that he was producing. Mm. Uh, so I kind of convinced him that I was capable of doing that and uh, that I had to kind of lock the door of the studio and uh, open up all the manuals and try and figure out how all these bits of Sony um, three quarter inch tape and mixing desks and things worked. And right. yeah, I had it that I had a sort of a year or so in Berlin making music videos for, for bands, which gave me the beginnings of a showreel. Yeah. So you were, you were behind the camera. I was. Yeah. And um, in a fantastically, um, uh, productive creative scene berlin at that point was just amazing i felt i wow. learned a lot i learned a lot more there than i did at cambridge wow uh, you know every every night you know you'd go out there 
there were bars and clubs and cafes and uh, you know there would always be like a, somebody would be dropping a, a you know old sheet from the ceiling and projecting some experimental film all the time everybody mm. was making stuff it was that that DIY um, ethos which was wow. very much part of the punk movement mm. uh, was fully there so that was incredibly exhilarating and yeah. I, learned, I, I learned a lot and then after a year I realized that this was an underground scene that was kind of fiercely defensive of itself and uh, anybody who tried to do anything outside of that scene in the commercial world was kind of uh, ostracized so I, ah. after after a year it felt like well do I want to be like an underground filmmaker in Berlin for the rest of my life and how am I going to afford that right and the alternative was to head back to London which I did with the beginnings of the show reel that I had and I spent then most of my 20s knocking around in London um, working in various jobs in film and television um, being an editor and um, being a writer and that was kind of what uh, brought me back into writing well, so how does that happen? What was so so so? When do you start writing? Uh, I guess. What, yeah. And yeah, in my late twenties, I guess I was um, I was working a lot for uh, documentary production companies, working for BBC and Channel Four, mm. and uh, generating a lot of ideas for documentaries. Coming up with some ideas myself, you know, working other people's ideas, writing mm. a little bit of little bits of drama, but mostly coming up with ideas and researching them. And I started to turn them into journalism when I could. Uh, yeah. And also um, sort of uh, writing screenplays in my spare time and starting to get a few screenwriting assignments. Oh, so that OK. Was, so, that's, so that was my route into writing. So you start moving away from like the visual medium and you start moving into in, you're still in you're still in this like motion picture kind of industry type but you're you're moving away from filming into to writing screenplays yeah that's right i think um i what i discovered by that point was that um i was not bad at some aspects of writing i was uh, I, I i was good at and editing was the other thing where i was pretty good the mm. bit in the middle the shooting which is really the core of filmmaking um i don't think I, you know, I, I didn't have a real flair for that. I was kind of, um, I always found when I was doing that, it was it was rushed. You were just trying to get the best. If you get 80% of your shooting script, you were doing okay. Um, mm. You know, I didn't really have that kind of, um, that sort of uh, visionary ability and the ability to kind of um, enthuse dozens of people working with me. I was kind of better I when I was found myself either at a desk or at a computer or at an editing console when right. I was pulling stuff together and uh, making sense of it. Yeah. And I also discovered then that in terms of um, screenplay writing and fiction, um, I was not, fiction was not, I, I discovered surely was not really my forte, that I mm. was, um, I never quite believed the characters that I was inventing and mm. I never quite believed the dialogue that I was giving them. Mm. Uh, so then what was great for me with books was the possibility of writing narrative non-fiction right. where you could use a lot of this fictional toolkit yeah. uh, and you were working with characters, real characters, but they were right. not characters that had come out of my head. They right. were characters that I'd generated, or sort of found in the sources and yeah. elaborated. Yeah. And then I found myself in a world writing popular history uh, mm. where most, most people writing popular history had come out of a more academic background and that I guess their model for the book was something like a lecture series, you know, eight chapters. Right. And my, mo my model for a book was still more, and I think still is, more like a movie, you know, yeah. something that has, that grabs people with a kind of um, opening scene with um, sort of drama and tension and conflict and then kind of mm -hmm. unpacks it and has... Uh, all the, and I use quite a lot of things that most historians don't use, like flashbacks and switches of perspective, yeah. you know, that yeah. kind of screenwriting toolkit. So right. in, in that sense, I think my writing career has been quite, uh, quite marked by uh, my early apprenticeship in film and TV. Mm, that is fascinating. Uh, was it so, so the transition to the, to the first book, is it, are you moving through writing, uh, you know, 
journalistic essays first and then like the book part is a natural progression or is it more of a discrete jump right into the book writing i had um uh always had books on the back burner books that i was writing un un unpublished novels you know you, i was i was kind of thinking back at it i was kind of working double time because i was doing office jobs pretty much all the time, paying yeah. the rent. And then when I came home in the evening, I was writing, you know, sort of four yeah. or five evenings a week. And that went on for a long time. I doubt I'd have the stamina to do that now. Yeah. But uh, the thing that kicked in that sort of got me onto the book writing was a fortuitous connection um, uh, with a, a, a medical historian who was mm. a uh, senior lecturer at the Welcome uh, trust in london which had an academic unit there uh what year would this have been what year this, you were in your 30s yeah this is kind of 90s mid 90s i guess uh-huh um yeah unit led by roy porter who you may have heard of a very prolific historian of medicine and a very interesting team of people who uh kind of rewrote the history of medicine um mm. which up until that point had been mostly you know retired doctors you know writing the story of their careers and the wonderful drugs they discovered right um, right uh, roy and uh, michael neve and bill bynum all the, the people who were working out of the welcome there they had come out of more out of the new left tradition of history from below mm. and um so they looked at medicine not from the point of view of the doctors but more from the patients they were very interested in patient testimonies uh. in the doctor doctor patient relationship in how the rest of the culture saw the medical profession yeah uh and that was fascinating to me and um i started doing a bit of work with them there and um that led to um a couple of anthologies that i edited for uh, penguin for penguin classics so that's uh, your first book it's an anthology you're like yeah. you're, you're editing more or you're collect you're collecting a your collect it's more of a collection that you that was your first entry in that's right yeah uh -huh. um so the first one was a collection of texts around 1900 and the founders siècle which i co-edited with uh um michael neve who was uh, mm. one of the welcome academics mm. and uh while i was doing that i talked to the editor at penguin and doing another one which is an anthology of drug literature called mm. artificial paradises why were you interested in medicine why were you interested in medicine i didn't see I that guess, coming um no i didn't see that coming it certainly didn't come out of philosophy i think almost everything that i've been interested in writing about is stuff that was in the interstices in the gaps of my um you know a formal education yeah and yeah. um so uh i and i'd got kind of a, a, from early on drugs was one of the things that i was writing about because mm. this was yeah the early mid 90s um i was an early so it was the drug it wasn't just i yeah i guess like when you say medicine you are kind of talking a lot about drugs but like i guess i was it wasn't that you were interested in like health conditions you're interested in medicine you're interested in, in drugs is I'm right? interested. Yeah, I guess I was interested in what would now be called the medical humanities. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm interested in the way that our understandings of um, health and science and the body kind of ripple out through our culture. Ah. Um, and drugs struck me as an interesting topic in that at the moment, because it was very much not discussed. I mean, at yeah. that time, drugs was the drug problem so pretty much right. everything was was either about addiction or you know criminality right but it was fascinating to me that people were going you know out every weekend on raves and um taking mdma and doing something that you know right. according to all the medical authorities was a terrible dangerous bad delinquent thing to do right but people were at the same time having enormously positive life-changing experiences out of this and I was, so I was guess I was kind of looking for a language for a way mm. of talking about that and using medical history to um you know give me a framework for that that's interesting so so you've got this like personal interest but the something about writing from this historical perspective is giving you yourself an ability to kind of 
process navigate some of this your own interest in these things is, is there something to what you're saying i, I just want to be curious yeah. how you're articulating that no i think that's right and i think um i mean first of all it was you know it was something that i could sell as journalism because it right. was a it's a perennially sexy subject right and that's what that's why i've returned to it a lot uh yeah. you know i thought kind of about 15 years ago i was done with it i'd written two or three books about the history of drugs and i was at that point on, on to other things and i still do write a lot of other things on other subjects yeah. um but you know it's the subject that there was always kind of demand for you know it's a bit edgy and nobody writes about it very confidently and uh yeah. Um, one of the questions that, uh, you know, I saw. And what ask, drugs are you writing about? What are you writing about? You're not writing about penicillin. You're writing about. Yeah, I'm writing about the, um, writing about and un unpacking that sort of um, corpus of uh, what we call, you know, illicit drugs. or Illicit drugs. drugs. I mean, that was, I mean, I, I have written about um, medicinal drugs and lots of other contexts mm -hmm. but this particularly interested me because it seemed to be at an interface of a kind of philosophy of mind you know yeah. there's a lot to learn about the mind and the way it works right and there was also a lot to learn about our culture which is very bifurcated at this moment you know you can this experience you know the the, the drug culture was kind of mainstream at this point but uh, mm. it was treated in mainstream media and culture as if it was something kind of a small dirty delinquent corner until you went on the the internet and then you know that was one of the very first things that colonized the internet were all those alt news groups and yeah. bulletin boards and people discussing everything so mm. that was a kind of fertile you know position to be in to be able to relay that into the wider culture yeah. and then the question that always came up was like well, where did these things come from? Where did right. cannabis come from? Where did cocaine come from? And uh, um, that was what led me, you know, with uh, some support from the Wellcome Institute and a great library on the history of medicine there. But that turned out to be just a, um, a treasure trove of untold mm. stories because mm. uh, they um, all these um, substances that we'd kind of lumped together in this category of drugs are all very different they all come from different places they all emerge from different contexts yeah some, some from 18th century chemistry some right. from you know other non non-western cultures yeah. um their story plays out through kind of pharmacology and mm. uh psychiatry and the mind sciences and uh are full of you know full of interesting insights into how we've ended up where we have today mm. so that turned out to be very early on to be a sort of fertile seam that kind of launched me uh as, as a writer what's the first hook what do you what's the first draw like how, how are you going about it i guess what is your first book the 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 full non-anthology historical story of a, of drugs and and what class are you focused on initially right um well, I, I wrote a book uh, early on called Emperors of Dreams, which was about drugs in the 19th century, because that oh. seems to be where all these stories started. Mm. And um, it was, uh, you know, at the beginning of the 19th century, you know, in Western culture, there's alcohol and there's opium and that's about it. Right, you know? right. By the end of the 19th century, you're walking into pharmacies and you can order up cocaine or morphine or cannabis or, you know, opium or sort of, uh, you know, and you've got, uh, you know, people have discovered um, anesthetics and are experimenting with nitrous oxide and ether. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it's, it's an enormous, it's, it's an enormous range. It's a big pharmacopoeia that gets assembled in the course of the 19th century. So mm -hmm. I, I did my best to tell that story. Well, uh, so when you think about, you know, drugs today, and you said it at the beginning, when you say illicit drugs, you know, it, it's, it's like, I just have this like, inescapable mindset about drugs that, you know, it's just a product of being born in, in 1975 in the United yeah, States. Yeah. So, you know, there's just this profound stigma and, mm -hmm. and it's, and it's illegal and dangerous and all these things, but what, what would have been, you know, like, as this transition is happening uh, in the 19th century, what would the typical, you know, uh, English person, young person, adult, 
what would their mindset have been about these new things? They were probably so interesting and, and very, you know, pleasant kinds of experiences. What, what, what was the broader kind of cultural mm-hmm. mindset and about this stuff? And how often were people using drugs? Right. I mean, this is, I've looked at my uh, forthcoming book, which is coming out next year, is kind of, is, is focused on this, but particularly on 19th century science. I mean, the, the word drugs, as we use it today, this word that you grow up with, with all these pejorative associations baked into it, that word doesn't even exist until 1900. Mm. You know, and until that point, drugs means just all medications uh, right. in, the, in the same way that we still use it at like drugstore or whatever. Right, right. You know, so the idea that there is this category of drugs, which are kind of bad and, you know, they have that they're kind of foreign and criminal and dangerous. That hasn't really coalesced until the 20th century. And I think because, as you say, that was became so ingrained in our consciousness in the 20th century, we kind of assumed it had always been thus. But in fact, if yeah. you go back before 1900, you enter a different world. Uh, it's scientists, um, you know, going all the way back to the beginnings of the science, scientific revolution, if they're studying drugs that alter the mind, the vast majority of them do that on the obvious way, down route one. They take them themselves and write right. about their experiences. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, and that informs, of course, the popular perception, if you think of very, very popular fictions like Jekyll and Hyde for, or Sherlock Holmes, mm. um, you know, this self-experimenting scientist becomes a fascinating character. Yeah. And of course, in the fiction, it always goes wrong. Goes wrong, you know? yeah. It's like a Michael Crichton novel, you know, yeah, West yeah. Wet Westworld is not a story if all the robots work okay. You have to right, have right. a terrible right. glitch or a malfunction before you get to act three. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, so, I interviewed <clears throat> this, I interviewed this psychiatrist that you've probably heard of, Rick Strassman. Uh oh yeah. Yes, and, yes, I know, Rick. Yeah. Um he had I was talking to him about that because in the history of psychedelics, the 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 self-experimenting science is just like you know the a, as much of the 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 story as the you know well i mean it's like you you have timothy leary but you, you have just like uh, overwhelming and and he said something interesting he said the self-experimenting doctor it is just like the typical story it's like a very common story not just about psychedelics but just they would go that this idea that the doctor would go first is yes. kind of a is a whole thing and it's rooted he said in uh the principles of do no harm yeah it is there's, so there's a whole thing going back into particularly into medical science that you would don't you don't experiment on the sick patients that's right un, un, that's unethical so who do you experiment on and then there's also the question in the 19th century of what kind of data is this? If I take a drug and have an experience, I can't hold that experience up to other people and say, see for yourself, because it's right. something that happened in my own mind. So I yeah. need to find a language for talking about this. Mm. So, and this all, I, I mean, Isaac Newton, for example, very early on um, was uh, uh, he famously and gruesomely sticks a bodkin a needle in his eye and moves it around and describes uh you know the strange um after effects and colors and images that he sees wow. and he draws a draws a diagram of this with everybody you know with every point labeled a b c d e as to how you do this so in other Goodness. words this is, this is not data like the data that he's getting out of prisms and studying light but it is data and if you want to follow it you have to do it yourself you know that's the uh, right. um that was the, uh, uh, the, you know, the Royal Society motto, don't take anybody's worth, word for it, do it yourself. So there's that tradition, huh. which what, what, as Rick Strasman was talking about. And then there's another tradition which emerges in the 19th century, which is about objectivity. Everything should be as data-based as possible, and we should exclude anything subjective or sort of personal to the experimenter. Mm. And particularly in psychology, when you get the first laboratory psychologists, so they're studying how long it takes between shining a light in your eye and it blinking, you know, they're unpicking all these, um, you know, mental processes like um, perception and sensation. And this is a tradition that isn't really working with drugs because it's working with brass instruments. It's trying to get measurements for everything. 
Yeah. So there's a fascinating dialogue between those two and um, self-experiment um, kind of disappears from uh, a lot of, you know, regular medications where you can tell what they're doing by measuring blood pressure or, you know, sort of physical external measurements. But it hangs on in these psychoactive or mind altering drugs because mm. the data that you're studying is not susceptible to objective measurement. Right, right. I guess this also kind of speaks to, from what I understand about the the limitation of the animal studies. Yeah, about, about right. any of these mind altering because there's just no way to extract that information that's about right. what they're what they're experiencing. Yes, that's right. And animals. I mean, I think sort of one of the early formative figures in this story is Humphrey Davy, the British chemist who discovered nitrous oxide. Mm. And um, he uh, tried that on um, rats and rabbits and uh, you know animals, but of course they can't tell you if they're hallucinating or not. They can't tell you what's going on in their heads. So fortunately for him, he had people like uh, Robert Southey and Samuel Taylor Coleridge in his circle who could, um, you know, inhale nitrous oxide and then give a description of their experience. Yeah. Uh, that, which is what, what Davy called a language of feeling. That was what he was looking for. You know, he found mm. that people were very bad at describing these kind of internal states. Right. The, the, the classic doctor question is, how do you feel? Right. And people were kind of, uh, uh, so he got a coterie of very sort of progressive, creative, um, quite competitive uh, people together to try and give their descriptions of what this was like. And mm. this idea of a language of feeling dovetailed very well with the young romantic poets he was working with because they were also looking for a language of feeling. They wanted a way to talk about mental states and moods that had never been described before. Mm. 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 So from that point on, then the self-experimentation has a literary dimension. Yeah. And a lot of, a lot of doctors are literary figures a lot of them write poetry and right. novels right. and um yeah this was something that uh um oliver sacks i think used to write about very well this that was this is really his golden age you know when people mm. when you didn't have a pill or a dsm tick box diagnosis you had to describe you had to learn how to describe your patients and um what they were experiencing in very fine detail so it's a wonderful rich literature i think that medical mm. literature from the 19th century yeah 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 ah uh, that's fascinating um uh, i was curious it, it seems like from your 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 resume you, you've written so many books about psychedelics is that is that accurate am i, am I reading it correctly i know of only uh, one, a, a one but but did it look like there were several others is that wrong I've written about psychedelics in lots of different um, capacities. In the, in the sort of history of drugs, um, the word psychedelic is interesting. You know, when you, I mean, it was obviously coined, you know, by uh, um, uh, Aldous Huxley and Humphrey Osmond in the 1950s. Yeah. Um, it's a hard word to apply when you go back into history before that point or into non Western cultures. Mm. So a lot of the history that I've been writing about is around um, hashish or cannabis, for example, or about um, uh, ether and chloroform and mm. those kind of um, inhalants and anesthetics. And to me, that is a psychedelic literature because it's concerned with the limits of consciousness and out of body mm. experience and the re relation between imagination and dream and reality. Yeah. But it's yeah. not strictly psychedelic, you know, right. there's, there's no LSD back in the day. There's no MDMA, you know, there's, uh, there is, you know, the one compound we may get on to talk about more, which is mescaline. Yeah. Um, but I think in many ways, what's what we now put under the rubric of psychedelics that kind of, you know, exploring the mind with drugs um, did exist previously, and I've written about it quite a lot, but um, it's not really what you call a psychedelic history, because there is no notion of psychedelics at that point. Mm, mm, mm. So th this, th this book that you, you wrote, uh, I have it here, um, Mescaline, oops, Mescaline, uh, A Global History of the First Psychedelic with Yale yep. University Press, 2018, I think. Is that right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. 2019, uh, I think. 2019? I think. Okay. Don't, don't, don't quote me on that. Yeah. Uh, wonderful book. Absolutely 
fascinating book. How, how did, what was the, the origins of that book? Well, this was um, one of the stories that I'd been, um, I'd had on the back burner for a long time and had written a little bit about, but always meant to do a much deeper dive, uh, was um, the, um, the story of how peyote, which was a, a cactus that yeah. contains mescaline that's native to uh, the north of Mexico and a little bit of the south of Texas, yeah. uh, and was known since time immemorial to uh, uh, Native American peoples. Um, that was uh, discovered um, by um, Western science in the 1890s. So it mm. very, very rapidly and a very, very few short years uh, between 1893 and 1897, um, this uh, cactus was brought back to Washington by an anthropologist uh, and ethnographer working with the Smithsonian, mm. who then gave it to um, the medical and scientific departments of the university there. So that was the first ever clinical trials of psychedelics. He passed samples of it on to um, you know, the most famous doctors of the day, people like uh, Weir Mitchell, who's America's leading neurologist, and to William James, the philosopher. And at the same time, uh, Western chemists were busying away and within a very short period of time had isolated um, the compounds that produced these, what we would now call psychedelic effects and called it mescaline. Yeah. So I'd always thought that was a really fascinating story of a kind of meeting of two worlds and two traditions yeah. and to see what happens uh, to this, um, this, this, this cactus as it's passed from the non-Western indigenous to the yeah. Western world as it passes from being a, a plant to being a chemical. Yeah. Yeah. So, so given that night, that 1800s context that you were mentioning where there was just so much discovery of what for lack of a better word mind altering or mm -hmm. consciousness type things what 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 was the reaction to this cactus you know by these people that were familiar with these other compounds at the time cannabis even what what did they think mm -hmm. when they when when they're presented with this with this uh this cactus well it's fascinating because of course it's very very different from the indigenous understanding yeah um it's uh, right from the very beginning, what you get that kind of classic Western kind of drilling down. So first of all, in the chemical terms, okay, what's in this cactus? What's doing this? Why is it producing these visual hallucinations? And that was what really fascinated everybody was what we could now call the visuals. Yeah. Something that indigenous people are not particularly interested in, by the way. What is, okay, you know? so, um, so, so <clears throat> con context here, the, the, the indigenous community, how many, how many distinct indigenous communities were aware of and and like incorporating in their their ceremonial life, if that's even true, uh, peyote? Well, it had been used for a very long time in uh, Mexico, particularly in northern Mexico. And we know from the very first written reports from the Spanish conquistadors that they found people using it there. Yeah. Um, yeah the Mexican Inquisition prohibited it. So the people who used it tended to hide out in the kind of canyon country in the north. And the people who really preserved their indigenous rights, um, who, you know, to this day are uh, a Mexican tribal people called the Huichol. Why are they prohibiting it if they're allowing alcohol or other kind? What, what, what is it that's sort of alarming? They must be observing something. Yeah, I think what they're observing is what they call the visions. They, mm. you know, people they observe people using peyote and under its influence, um, prophesying the future, um, ah. diagnosing illnesses, uh, searching for lost objects, attempting to mm. gain influence. All these magical operations. I see. So, so to is that disruptive? But, is that disruptive to the social order at that time? That like I, the go government would have thought that. Well, definitely. In fact, you know, this is these are Spanish conquistadors coming from Europe in the grips of the witch craze. So uh, where, are, where are all these visions coming from? And if they're not coming from the Christian God, they're coming from the devil. Got it. Got it. Got it. Oh, so there's a lot of religion, uh, religion, religion sort of in that that period. It's not public health and not even like so much as, uh, you know, like 
the 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 maintenance of society it, it, there's a lot of like religious uh concern yeah this is a barrier to the savages becoming civilized oh. and, and christian so they're this even is... banning it they're even once they they're even banning it not in england or spain but in the indigenous areas that they're beginning to occupy they're ba they're they're starting to ban it right there that's right and oh. uh uh, and, and it, but and then that the, you know they note very early on that uh, you know how devoted the Indians are to this and how they carry on in secret with their rights with these plants and mm -hmm. uh, but I think they were also as successive generations as you started to get to mestizo generations the people who are half Spanish and half Indian peyote mm -hmm. was used by those people as well for kind of sorcery and magic and mm -hmm. generally it was a source of kind of illumination and uh you know was, was outside the um ambit of the church yeah and uh that's the reason why it was uh, it was prohibited because it was the work of the devil and was leading people to the devil well so what about early 1900s what's going on there with the with uh with this 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 mexican indigenous community of nate and it's predominantly what we would consider to be like native do you remember the name of the what's the name of the tribes that that would have yeah, been that was the, I mean, the people who were, um, who, who still have it at the center of their culture, the, 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 the Huichol. Mm. Um, but then there was a kind of center of diffusion, which was around um, what's now the, uh, the border between Mexico and Texas, where it mm. grows around Laredo and in that area. And there were various um, uh, tribes who'd been there particularly apache groups the, uh -huh. the Pan, uh, mescalero and um but what happened at that point was um the which, which, you know which brought it into the sort of ambit of the plains tribes mm. was um the forced captivity on the reservations at the end of the indian wars when the indians were all then penned up in reservations and uh you know, at the same time as that, the arrival of the railroad that ran from uh, uh, Mexico up into Texas and up to Oklahoma. Yeah. So um, diffusing probably around out of southwest Oklahoma, out of the big reservation um, and the uh, Washita Mountains, which yeah. was where the uh, uh, Comanches and the Kiowa and the Apache were administered out of. That seems to be the place where um, uh, the uh, peyote use really got going in the 1880s, but that was something that hadn't, you know, th the tribes had, some tribes had known about it as a medicine prior to that, but it was it really just won't only... grow. It just won't grow up in Oklahoma, or it's not native up there. No, that's right. It's not native. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, so are they very... taking it up to Oklahoma? So, so you're, it, it sounds like what what I interpreted from the book is that it, it's like the conquering almost, and then the establishment of these trade routes, but it's the railroads in particular, that is just, there's just a movement of the, of the peyote from Mexico to Oklahoma. That's a big part of the story of the, of the Native American experience with peyote is railroads take it out of Mexico. Is that right? Yes, that's one big part of it. Another big part, of course, uh, is the um, in 1890 is the ghost dance movement, mm. the kind of um, pan Indian um, millenarian movement that was suppressed with uh, the massacre of uh, Wounded Knee, which mm. was really kind of the end of Indian culture, um, mm. or and certainly in the eyes of um, the federal government, uh, who were pursuing a policy of assimilation so there was no mm. such thing as far as they were concerned as Indian culture all these people their kids were being sent off to boarding schools they were all going to be just like regular Americans so what's, it's the, that, so what's the ghost dance movement the ghost dance movement was yeah a, a millenarian movement that emerged kind of uh, on the reservations among the people in forced captivity it emerged out of a prophecy which said that uh, here are new dances here are new songs we're going to get together and do these dances and do these songs and this is kind of an act of magic that will um you know 
wipe the white people and their culture away from our lands and will return us to our pristine ah, past see. before I there see. were white people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So for various Who's people, doing both, these? Is this up in Oklahoma? Uh, yeah, this is happening in Oklahoma and uh, its a center of gravity is in the is, is, is in the northern plains mm. um, among the Lakota people. So um, so Sitting Bull and so on, you know, where, where uh, the Wounded Knee Massacre took place. Yeah. But yes, it's also happening in in, in Oklahoma. Um, and some people, some tribes are sitting it out, uh, notably, you know, a big, uh, huge figure in this story, Quana Parker, the chief of the Comanches um, at that point, who had who had had previous experiences with millenarian prophets and his view was look okay we've got these uh, 160 acres of uh, um, southwest Oklahoma each we've got to make this work this is good pasture land there are cattlemen who'll pay good money for this we can get ourselves settled we can get ourselves established I'm not going to throw all this away just felt like a whole bunch of kind of um, sort of all day, all night dances that are going to end up being, you know, brutally suppressed by an American military. Yeah. So the, this was a I, dangerous. So the ghost dance is actually n has some risk. Very much so. Yeah. And it was, as I say, very, very brutally suppressed. Ah, and I see. It was kind of. Uh, you know, and, and, and it led to, you know, the breakup of all kind of tribal troops and you know, groups and a sort of wipeout of uh, indigenous culture. Yeah. So peyote, which was then available, was um, uh, started to be used. We don't quite know exactly where and when, but what emerged was a form of a peyote ceremony, which took place in a teepee. The reason it took place in a teepee was because all singing and dancing was banned after the ghost dance. You know, like the sun dance was banned. Um, there were Protestant missionaries on the reservations. You know, that was the official form of worship for mm. the in Indians in forced captivity. Uh, so um, it was in that context that uh, this emerged. It was a group of usually um, male war warriors, you know, people who'd grown up as warriors, expected to live in a warrior culture, now trying to adjust to forced captivity where the culture was being stamped out. Yeah. And uh, it emerged that uh, if you could hide out on, the res on, your, on your reservation in a teepee, uh, in a group of people around a fire and you could take the peyote, you could kind of recreate the magic of, um, of, of, of the old days, of your lost mm. culture and keep it going. And it became you know, a kind of a kind of incubator and a half for keeping uh, Native American culture alive. Are they growing peyote now in Oklahoma at that or are they shipping it from Mexico? Is it is it commercial? At that point or now? Yeah, at that point. At like that for point, this practice? Uh, no, at that point, it's being shipped. There are right on the border there around um, Laredo, there were, and there still are to this day, a handful of uh, um, sort of uh, Mexican mestizo families known as peyoteros who have traditionally uh, had the peyote trade there. And yeah. uh, people used to go down and buy peyote for them. And once the railroad was there, people would go down and buy it. And yeah, still at that time, people were going down with suitcases and filling them with peyote and traveling mm. back to the reservations so is that the only market for peyote at that time there's not really another you know like non-native american you know uh use at that time no peyote is not really understood at that time oh, there are botanical illustrations of it but no real sense of its uh, properties or qualities uh -huh. so yeah just around that time you're starting to get um uh there's a um a woman who's um uh, one of the first kind of commercial cactus traders who lives around there in uh, uh, Nichols in, in Laredo. And uh, she notices that uh, um, curanderos, uh, you know, uh, traditional doctors are using peyote for all kinds of things. They're making poultices out of it. They're making, you know, medicines out of it. And uh, they're also kind of um, drinking it ceremonially for visions. Yeah. And so, yes, yeah, she writes a letter to Park Davis at that point going, you know, you might be interested in this. So uh, um, the Western interest in peyote as a, <clears throat> as a medicine, it's 
uh, only starts after you know following up on the Indian use. So they're not interested. Uh, Americans and American scientists, they're not really at this time as intrigued maybe by the spirituality of it. They actually think it might have medicinal use. Yeah, the great um, proselytizer for peyote at that point is uh, this ethnographer with the Smithsonian Institution called James Mooney, who's a great lover of uh, Indian culture, speaks lots of Indian languages, you know, really knows more about their cultures than anybody else. Mm. Most of the other um, anthropologists or ethnographers are not very interested in peyote because it's something, it's something modern. It feels kind of decadent. It's a bit like, um, you know, there's this, all this abuse of strong spirits and alcohol on the reservations. They sort of see peyote in that context. It's just on that being, continuum, right. <laughs> on that right. continuum of being like a kind of, you know, you know like a, yeah. a sort of rather sad, um, degenerate habit. Um, right. Mooney sees the value that it has for preserving Indian culture. And, mm. um, why is yeah. that? Why would it preserve Indian culture? What what exactly is, is it? What exactly makes it so sticky for, for for that function? It's um one of the things that builds on in the ghost dance was pan tribal. You know, people came together from different tribes for it and built up lots of tribal links. Ah. So um, the peyote religion or the peyote meeting when it emerges. Um, keeps those tribal links going and uh, it builds up a sense of who we are as uh, people uh, yeah. all our shared traditions so all things like the cedar incense the eagle feathers the rattles and the drums you know it puts these all into a new context that all the right. tribes can share with one another and yeah. also it's something that's persecuted you know by the white man and by the western culture and it's always mm. been felt but back in the it's early mexican days it was always felt to have power against mm. the white man and against uh, you know this dominant culture and right. so it becomes uh, a kind of uh, and then the state of consciousness it produces is one in which the peyote um, in the indigenous belief is a person a non-human person but a person who in that context speaks to you gives you the message tells you what you need to hear right. and this may be medical in the sense that it's telling you you know, you should have a, get your heart checked out or you should stop drinking alcohol. That's a very right. common message that's spread mm. through these meetings. But it might also be all kinds of insights, you know, about family dynamics or friends or other people. Mm. And, um, and it brings everybody together to experience these things together. So it immerses people, you know, in a really kind of deep version of their own culture right at a point where everywhere else that culture is being um, emasculated and uh, broken up. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's interesting that the Christian church, or at least that particular Spanish uh, period had so much uh, opposition to it, but there's this character in your book, Frederick Madison Smith, who's a grandson of uh, the founder of, of the of the mormon religion mm -hmm. um he's a psychologist at harvard harvard trained mm -hmm. and he becomes a really important figure in actually granting almost like permanence of uh psychedelics in in the united states by creating these constitutional protections for the native americans i was wondering if you could just tell me a little that's that's such an unusual untold story it seems like it's such an unusual untold story it's so fascinating um yeah frederick smith as you say the, the grandson of of joseph smith he'd set up his own kind of breakaway version of the church of latter-day saints and he was a kind of a progressive figure as you say he studied psychology and he was uh, very much of that progressive era and believing that um uh modern society was becoming industrialized right. and uh, dehumanized and what people needed was uh, um, ecstatic experience and uh, a world to be re-enchanted mm. and of course um, the it always been very important to the Mormons the outreach to the tribes in uh -huh. Utah and that area 
Yeah. Uh, so Frederick Smith, in the course of that, had met, uh, had heard about the peyote meeting. He'd been invited to join different Indian tribes in the peyote mm -hmm. meetings. And he came out of those feeling, this is what we need. We need people not just to come into church and sing hymns. You know, we need people to have a proper transcendent religious, ex religious experience. Right. So, um, <clears throat> and he became involved with a small group of people. James Mooney was another one. And specifically in Oklahoma, uh, an attorney uh, called um, Carl Cunningham, uh, who defended Indians against persecution from peyote quite a lot. Mm. And in 1918, there were all there had always been attempts to ban, and there were all lots of local bans on peyote, state ones, reservation ones, and so mm. on. Uh, there was a big push in 1918. The House of Representatives moved for a federal ban on peyote to all Native Americans. So the banning of its sale on reservations and everywhere. And uh, that galvanized a movement in which uh, Frederick Smith and James Mooney and Carl Cunningham and other people pitched in and they managed just to swing the um, representative from Oklahoma so that uh, it uh, failed its passage by one vote. But then wow. they sat down, <clears throat> but then they sat down and said, well, look, this is going to carry on. The forces of prohibition, you know, are going to come for peyote. So we need to uh, have what um, uh, Carl Cunningham called an umbrella of protection. We need to protect ourselves from this somehow. So the idea that emerged was let's form a Native American church with peyote mm. as its sacrament. We incorporate it in the state of Oklahoma and then we're protected under the First Amendment. Now, so, was the Native American practice with peyote? So it's this is what I did not know until I read your book. I, it's so much I don't know. It this Native American church is an amalgam of indigenous spirituality and Christian church, right? It, the Christian religion, or is that an over? I mean, is that was that marketing that was kind of done to make it palatable, or was there actually some sort of fusion that had happened? It's really fascinating, and everybody you talk to in the Native American church will give you a slightly different story. And in a way, that's partly the point of it, uh, because um, quite a lot of um, uh, Native American groups had converted to Christianity by this point. Other mm. ones hadn't. So it's kind of um, deliberately left open so that people who believe in the Christian God can pray beside people who believe in the Great Spirit. Mm. Uh, it's um, there's also a level, you know, of um, what jurists have since called, you know, subsequent attempts have called kind of contrivance. Uh, you know, they it was definitely a bunch of people from different tribes getting together and saying, let's call this a religion and right. let's call it a church because that will give us protection against, you know, the prohibition of drugs and the banning of peyote that's coming. So yeah. in that yeah. sense, it's partly a strategy, but yeah. it also yeah. reflects the reality of a very diverse Native American world. It's right. incidentally, I, as far as I can tell, and this was news to me until um, I, was, I, I was told this on my travels in Oklahoma, that this is the first time the word Native American was used, was in the ah. Native American church. Oh. Because um, Native Americans were not Americans, they were not granted citizenship until 1925. Um, the uh, Roosevelt's Indian New Deal in the 30s kind of instituted a lot of these kind of protections for religion and culture. But back in 1918, there was nothing like that. So uh, the concept of Native American was new and the concept of Native American church was really striking. Mm, mm. So they're successful. They get some sort of constitutional protections. Is that right? This is part of the, well, it's just sort of the, the Frederick Smith and Mooney and others. Yeah. But what exactly do they accomplish? Well, once the um, church is incorporated in Oklahoma, then I think it's automatically incorporated in every other state, except for the states where peyote is already illegal, which is Utah and Colorado and Arizona, I think, at that point. Uh, they set up uh, a church which then spreads out of Oklahoma. Soon there are chapters 
right across the southwest and going up into the northern plains. They're still heavily persecuted. The leaders of the movement are still locked up. Um, you know, peyote is still intercepted between reservations. You know, so uh, you know the, uh, the you know that that battle is won, but the war continues. And yeah, by the 1950s, there are chapters of the Native American Church right over the American states and Canada. It has to change its name to the Native American Church of North America so that it can include the First Nations of Canada and their chapters. But the but what I meant was Frederick Madison Smith and others are explicitly saying the they're gonna they're 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 going to allow the Native Amer the, the United States government is gonna have to actually allow for the Native American church to ceremonially, legally uh, have peyote in its, in its practice, right? That, yeah, and that, required, right. that required some sort of, what did that require? That and required that the, the incorporation of the church as a legal ent entity protected under the First Amendment with mm. peyote as its sacrament. Mm. So then you have kind of official religious use. Right. So essentially, I mean, James Mooney is very well documented because he's always talk in, in Washington on committees and hearings. Uh, there are always um, calls to ban peyote from uh, religious leaders, Christian groups, from the sort of, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs. And he's often the only person standing up there and arguing its case. And it's interesting that his case is, is kind of two pronged, really. One is this is a very valuable medicine. You know, it should be part of the Western pharmacopoeia. We should be researching this. We have a lot to learn. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that's the contradiction to the the other side, which is saying this isn't a religion. This is just a kind of drunken orgy, and right. um, this peyote is toxic, and uh, yeah. you know, and, 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 and de you know, causes degenerative illnesses. Right. So he's arguing for it on medicinal grounds, but he's also arguing it on religious grounds, saying you know. This is, um, and it, you know, these people who have formed the Native American church are the pillars of the community. You know, where these people are strong and active, um, people are giving up alcohol, they're becoming productive. This is the new young generation. You know, they're not warriors, but what they are is, um, you know, community leaders and teachers, you know, they're becoming literate and civilized. This is what we want, you know, people right. don't, uh, you know, we should be encouraging this. Yeah, 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 yeah. I could talk with you all day. Uh, this is your, 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 uh, your book uh, is so, so fascinating. And we've just barely uh, scraped the, the surface of it. Um, and, and everything that you've worked on is, is, uh, is just sounds so interesting. And, and um, uh, am I, I, I'm right. You have a, uh, a, a new book coming out next year. I do. What it's is the name called... of that? What, what is that? That is called Psychonauts, Drugs and the Making of the Modern Mind. Oh, interesting. And that, is, and that is really the story of how, if you rewind before the 20th century, yeah. um, uh, drug experiments and drug experiences are a huge part of science and medicine and philosophy and culture. And so that era that we think of as the birth of the modern mind, so the beginning of psychology, the birth of the unconscious, the arrival of modernism, that was full of drug experiences that mm. uh, we have kind of edited out. So what I'm trying to do mm. is to res restore that story. Mm. That, that's, that's, wh wh what is it gonna, where's, where are you gonna stop in that story? What year? Um, I, most of the book is about that pre-1900 period, uh. um, but the final section of the book I kind of look at two periods. One, the period around 1900, uh -huh. uh, where, where the word drugs, as we now know it, was coined. Yeah. And what, what that was about, what that shift represented, because uh, it was a much broader closing down of interest in introspection or mystical mm. experience. You know, it was the period of the rise of behaviorism and so on. And then the final chapter is looking at the years are at the late 1950s and early 1960s, mm. which is the backlash against that. That's the period when all this re-emerges, when people get interested in mystical experience again, and people like William James again, uh, and when a younger post-war generation discovers mm. what their parents called, quote, drugs. 
right. uh, actually produce extraordinary and uh, you know valuable and positive experiences. Mm. And so that kind of presents what we think of as the psychedelic movement, you know, the emergence of the psychedelic movement, not as something that came out of nowhere, but as a recovery of a much longer and older tradition. Yeah, yeah. I, I cannot wait till it comes out. Well, thank you, uh, Mike. It has been just a real pleasure to, to hear uh, you, you just, the, 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 your storytelling of, of all of this. It's just been absolutely fascinating and um, uh, strongly encourage the listener to, to definitely at least check out um, Mescaline, A Global History of the First Psychedelic at Yale University Press. It's just phenomenal. Thank you so much. Oh, real pleasure, Scott. Thank you.